great. We're going to make a start. I think everybody's now here. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Um, we are Oxford, obviously, Oxford University. This is the Oxford Classics faculty. Um, and we're here to read to you from our own translations of Iliad 6 as part of the European Festival of Latin and Greek. Before we do that, I'd like briefly to um, thank the Archive of Performances of Greek and Roman Drama, or the APGRD, for organising this event, and in particular Zoe Jennings, um, their Archivist Administrator, for everything that she's done to bring this together. I'm not going to uh, name the translators, although you will be able to find them in the description of this video. I'm also not going to tell you a huge amount about Iliad 6 because um, you will have uh, all of these translators to help you discover it. So. Um, with that bit done, I'm going to, to pass on to the very first of our translators for the beginning of Iliad Book 6. Thanks. So, the grim clashing of Trojans and Achaeans was abandoned by the gods. And widely on the plain, this way and that, swept the battle, men aiming bronze-tipped spears at one another between the waters of Simois and Xanthos. First to break the line of Trojans was Ajax, son of Telamon, shield of the Achaeans, who gladdened his companions when he struck Achamas, son of Eosaurus, noblest among the Thracians, a big man and a brave one. First, Ajax struck the crest of his horsehair helmet, then the bronze spear point lodged in his forehead and passed through the bone, and darkness covered his eyes. Axelos, son of Teuthros, fell to Diomedes, great battle crier. Axelos, whose home was in well-built Arisba, who was rich in life's necessities and a friend to all, for he dwelt by the road and welcomed everyone kindly. But none of them now stood protector to save him from mournful destruction. Neither him nor Calasios, his companion in arms and charioteer in those days. Death made off with both their spirits. The two of them sank below the earth. Dresus and Epheltios were dispatched by Euryalus, who next went after Isipos and Pedasos, born long ago by the river nymph a Barbaria to noble, to noble Bucolion. Bucolion was son to noble Leomedon, his eldest son, but birthed by his mother in secret. Out tending his sheep, he came together with A Barbaria in the pleasures of love, and she conceived and bore twin sons. Now their strength and their gleaming limbs were undone by the son of Mechistius and he stripped the weapons from their shoulders. A stylus fell to steadfast Polypoites. Pedites of Percote was dispatched by Odysseus with his bronze spear, a noble Aretean by Teucros. Ableros was snuffed out by Antilochos, son of Nestor, with his shining spear shaft, and Elatos by Agamemnon, lord of men. He had lived in lofty Pedasos by the banks of the fair flowing Satnuis. Philokos, running for his life, was taken down by the hero Laetos. Melanthios was dispatched by Eurypylos. And then Adrestos was caught alive by Menelaus, great battle crier. For as his horses fled in terror on the plain, they fell foul of a tamarisk branch, smashed the curved chariot where it joins the pole, and ran towards the city where the other horses were heading in fear and bewilderment, while Adrestos rolled out of the chariot over the wheel and landed face down in the dust. And Menelaus, son of Atreus, stood beside him, holding his long shadowed spear. Then Adrestos took hold of his knees and begged, take me alive, son of Atreus, and you will receive a king's ransom. My father is a rich man. His house is piled high with treasure, bronze and gold and well-wrought iron, which he would gladly give you in boundless ransom if he heard that I was alive among the ships of the Achaeans. So he spoke and would have swayed the other's heart 
for Menelaus was poised to send him to the Greeks' swift ships, a servant at his side. But Agamemnon stood in his way and loudly called to him as follows, Dear, oh dear, Menelaus, what brings you to take pity on these men? Were we at home so finely respected by the Trojans? Let none of them escape destruction at our hands, not even babies whom the mother carries in her womb. They shan't escape, but all of Ilium shall die, unwitnessed and ungrieved. With these words, the hero changed his brother's mind for what he said was right. So Menelaus pushed back the brave Adrestus for lordly Agamemnon to spear him in the side. He fell and Atreus' son planted his foot on his chest, withdrawing the ashen spear. Meanwhile, Nestor was calling loudly to the Argives. Beloved Danaan warriors, hand servants of Ares, do not get distracted by the spoils and let them keep you back in the hope of taking the most to the ships. Our purpose is to kill and after, at your ease, scour the plain for bodies, but only once they're dead. With these words, he fired each man with strength and spirit. And so, beneath the Argive zeal for war, the Trojans might have caved and fallen back into the city, if Lord Aeneas and Hector had not been approached by Priam's son Helenus, the best of all diviners. Aeneas and Hector, as you two bear the brunt of the task we Trojans and Lycians face, being the best in every way, in fighting and in council too. Stand forth and gather your people before the gates, lest all retreat, collapsing as they make their flight into their women's arms, a scene of joy for our foes. When you've managed to rally all the troops together, we'll stay here to hold our ground against the Greeks. Weary as we are, necessity demands it. But Hector, you go back inside the walls and tell our mother, yours and mine, to lead the elder women up to the citadel, to the shrine of bright-eyed Athena. Take the key and open the doors of the holy temple, bringing from the palace the most magnificent of her robes, whichever she feels is best and holds most dearly. Lay it before the knees of lustrous-haired Athena, promising her a yearly sacrifice in her temple of twelve unbroken heifers, that she might take pity on the city of Troy, its wives and innocent children, keeping Tydeus' son away from Ilium's shrine, that savage warrior and mighty master of terror, whom I declare to be the best of all the Greeks. Achilles, prince of men, does not inspire such fear, and folk say he's a goddess son. Diomedes rages too much, None comes close to him in strength. <coughs> Thus he spoke, nor did Hector his blood brother disdain. At once he leapt to the ground in arms out of the chariot, and brandishing sharp twin spears, he began to go all over throughout the army, inciting them to fight, and raised a dreadful din. Round they wheeled and took a stand against the Achaeans. But the Argives drew back, left off the bloodshed, as if some one of the immortals had come down from the star-studded sky to help them, so the Trojans rallied. And Hector had called out to the Trojans with a great cry, Trojans high of spirit and allies famed far and wide, be virile, my friends, and mindful of your belligerent strength. So I may go to Ilium and tell the council of elders and our wives to invoke the divinities and hecatombs to promise. When indeed he had voiced this, off went Hector of the shimmering helmet. About his ankles and neck the dark hide pulsed, flapped the outermost edge of the bossed shield. Glaucus, child of Hippolochus, and the son of Tydeus from either side, closed together in the midst, bursting to do battle. And when they were coming close to each other, first Diomedes, good in the war cry, addressed him, Who are you, most courageous one, out of mortal mankind? 
For you I have not ever sighted before in renown bringing battle, but now, at any rate, much have you from all stood out in your boldness, for you wait in line for my spear casting lengthy shadows, and they face my might, the sons of woebegone men. Yet if you have come, one of the deathless ones down from the sky, I, for one, would not battle against the celestial gods. For the son of Dryas, powerful Lycurgus, was not, not at all long in life, he who strove against the heavenly gods. Once he agitated the nurses of Bacchus in inspiration over most sacred Nisa. Together all dropped the sac sacrosanct orgiac instruments, ox goad stricken by man slaying Lycurgus. Dionysus, affrighted, into the rip of the sea dove, and Thetis received him in her folds, afraid. For at the offensive of the man, strong trembling took hold of him. And then the gods who easily live detested him, and him the child of Cronus rendered blind. Certainly he was not long lived any longer, since he was held hostile among all the immortal gods. So I would not will to fight the blessed gods, but if you are of mortals who crop what is plucked from ploughable land, come closer, so more swift may you touch the ledge of destruction. <coughs> and then the son of Hippolochus answered, Son of Tydeus, why does it matter where I'm from or who my family are? Men come and go like leaves falling from the trees, the wind shakes them to the ground in the autumn, but when the time comes again, spring puts buds back onto the vines. Generations of humans are like that too. New ones bud just as the old ones are falling from the branches. But I'm surprised that you want to know my life story when so many know it already. There is a city in the grasslands of Argus where horses graze, called Ephira, where Sisyphus lived, that man who thought he knew everything. He was the son of Aeolus and had a son named Glaucus, who was the father of Bellerophon, whom the gods had crafted with charm and beauty. But Proteus took against him, and since he was much stronger than Bellerophon, drove him out of the land of the Argives, the land where he ruled by the grace of Zeus. You see, Antea, for better or worse, Proteus's wife, fancied the pants off him and, and would have slept with him in secret, but Bellerophon thought about it, and then he refused, and so she told lies about him to her husband. Proteus, she said to him, you have two options. Kill Bellerophon or wish that you yourself were dead. For you know he would have raped me if he could. The king was annoyed, but he refused to kill Bellerophon, preoccupied instead with important matters like what his wife had been wearing or what would happen to the successful young man's <laughs> reputation. But instead, sent him to Lycia with a secret message written inside of a folded letter, a message that would be dangerous for its messenger. He told Bellerophon that he should show the message to his father-in-law, hoping that he would kill him so that Proteus didn't have to. It was always the way, he said, to send someone who's done terrible things beyond the boundaries of the land and leave them to the gods that they've prayed to. When Bellerophon came to the river Xanthos in Lycia, the king, the king seemed almost pleased to see him. Together they partied for nine days straight, and the king killed nine heifers in, it, in his honour, which really should have been a sign, but Bellerophon took it as a strange kind of welcome. But when rosy-fingered dawn drew back the curtain of darkness for the tenth day of his visit, the king questioned Bellerophon and demanded to see the message that his son-in-law Proteus had sent. As soon as he had cast his eyes over the message, he suddenly and completely out of nowhere commanded Bellerophon to kill a monster. And not just any monster, the Chimera, who was nothing like a human, but rather some kind of goddess with the fire-breathing head of a lion and the tail of a serpent and the body scarier than it sounds of a goat. <laughs> Against the odds, Bellerophon killed her. His god had, it seemed, not forgotten him. Next, he fought the descendants of, of Solmius and called them the harshest of opponents, not knowing who was to come next. Lastly, he killed the Amazons, women who fought like men, and as he was making his way back, the king devised yet another plan to destroy him. He picked out the strongest fighters in all of Lycia, except, of course, for the Amazons, who were already dead, and stationed them lying in wait to ambush him. And not a single one returned, because Bellerophon had killed every last one. 
It was only then, after he had killed so many, that the king of Lycia knew that Bellerophon must be the child of a god, and, as if that made everything okay, he kept him in Lycia, and gave him his blessing to marry his daughter, and made him equal with himself in running the kingdom. The Lycians even gave him a piece of land, the nicest place in the whole country, rich in vineyards and fields for growing crops, hoping that he'd stay with them. Together, the king's daughter, who had some kind of name that I don't remember, and Bellerophon, together had three children, Isandros, Laodomir, and Hippolochus. Zeus, who's supposed to be wiser than all of this, had a child with Laodomir, Sarpedon, who you might have heard of. Um, but things didn't always go so well for Bellerophon. Eventually, he fell from the favour of the gods and wandered alone and lost on the Elean plain, his grief chewing at his own heart and avoiding at all costs ever loving another human ever again. Ares killed his son Isandrus when he was fighting the Salimi, and his daughter was strangled by Artemis and her golden reins. She, she was upset with her for some reason that I don't remember. Um, being descended from a god doesn't always excuse everything. But Hippolochus was my own father, and when he sent me to Troy, he told me over and over and over again to fight with everything I am and not to shame the blood of my fathers. It's not like I want to kill you, but this is the kind of responsibility that comes from that sort of nobility, and since you asked, that's the kind of family that I'm from. <laughs> Thus Glaucus spoke, and Diomedes, strong in the shout, rejoiced. He stuck his spear fast in the much-nourishing earth, but he spoke soothing words, the shepherd of the people. Now you are a guest friend to me from my father's house of old, for shining Oeneus once received as a friend excellent Bellerophon in his house, keeping him there for twenty days, and they also gave fine guest gifts to each other. Oeneus gave his sword belt shining with purple, while Bellerophon gave a golden goblet with two handles, and I am descended from him, going into my house. But I do not remember Tydeus, my father, since he died when I was still young, when the people of the Achaeans were perishing at Thebes. So now I am a dear guest friend to you here in the middle of Argos, and you and Lycia, if either of us ever reach our homes. But let us keep our spears away from each other through the battle today, for many renowned Trojans and their allies wish to kill me, which, if a god may permit it, and I fall on my feet. Or again, on the other hand, many Achaeans would slay you, if they can do it. And let us exchange our armour with each other, so these men also will know that we are sworn to be ancestral guest friends. And so, after they had both spoken, they jumped down from their horses, and they took each other's hands and bound themselves by oath. But here again Zeus the son of Cronos took away the wits from Glaucus, who exchanged his golden armour with Diomedes the son of Tydeus in return for copper, the worth of a hundred oxen for nine. Meanwhile Hector came to the sky and gates and the great oak, and around him ran all the wives of the Trojans and the daughters, asking about their children and brothers and kinsmen and husbands. And then he ordered them all, one after the other, to pray to the gods, but their troubles touched him in many ways. And so he came to the beautiful house of Priam, built with polished stone porticos, and in it there were 50 inner rooms of dressed stone, all built near one another, and in them the sons of Priam used to sleep with their wedded wives, and on the other side, opposite, from inside the palace, there were 12 covered chambers, also of dressed stone, close by each other, in which the daughters of Priam lived with their most respected husbands. And there his bountiful mother came in, leading in Laodice, in appearance the best of her daughters, and took him by the hand, speaking a word to him and calling him by name. My child, why have you left the bold battle coming here? For the powerful sons of the Achaeans are wearing us down, fighting around the city. But your spirit has led you in here, coming to hold up your hands to Zeus from the greybeard at, from the highest point. But stay, so that I may send for the honey-sweet wine, and you may make a drink offering to Zeus the father and the other gods first, and that I may solve my benefit if I drink. For wine greatly builds up the strength for a toiling man, as you have been working all day defending your kinsmen. And then to her, mighty Hector, he of the flashing helm, made his reply. Do not bring me wine, mother, honey sweet as it may be. You might weaken my resolve, and I might become forgetful of my valour. And I would not dare pour libations to Zeus with unwashed hands. It is not right, not right at all, to invoke Cronos' son, him up there in the black clouds while caked in blood and gore. But as for yourself, go to the shrine of Athena, she who brings plunder, bearing burnt offerings accompanied by the other elder women, and a robe, the finest and largest in your chambers, the one which you most treasure. 
lay this robe on the knees of Athena, the goddess with lovely hair, and promise to her that you will sacrifice twelve immaculate year-old cows in her shrine if she will have mercy on our city, on the wives of the Trojan men, and on their young children, you will hold back the son of Tydeus, Diomedes, that savage spearman, zealous agent of terror from sacred Ilium. Go now to the shrine of Athena, she who brings plunder. I myself will go and track down Paris. I wish to have a word with him, if he'll pay any attention to what I have to say. How I wish that the ground would swallow him up. For Zeus the Olympian surely preserved him to be the dread ruin of Troy, of Priam, he with his mighty heart, and of all Priam's sons. If I were to see him slip down into the world below, then, then, I think my heart might be rid of its endless pain. So he spoke. Going to the great hall, Hecabe called to her handmaids, who gathered together the elder women of the city. She herself descended to the storeroom, redolent of incense, where the robes were kept, intricate robes, the products of Sidonian women, women seized from Sidon by glorious Paris as he sailed the high seas. It was the same journey on which he brought back the noble Helen. Hecabe chose one of these robes and took it as a gift for Athena. It was the most finely embroidered. It was the largest of them all, as brilliant as a star. It lay beneath all the others. She left, and the many elder women hurried behind her. When they got to Athena's shrine in the heights of the city, Fiano flung open the doors to them. Fiano, fair of face, Fiano, daughter of Kisius, Fiano, wife of Antenor, he who reared horses. For the Trojans had made Fiano priestess of Athena. All the women raised their hands and their voices to Athena. Fiano, fair of face, took the robe and laid it on the knees of Athena, the goddess with lovely hair, and in prayer, she invoked the daughter of mighty Zeus. Our lady Athena, protector of our city, goddess among goddesses, shatter Diomedes' spear and grant that he might fall face first before the sky and gates. To this end, we shall sacrifice 12 immaculate year old cows in your shrine if you will have mercy on our city, on the wives of the Trojan men and on their young children. So Fiano delivered this prayer, but Pallas Athena wasn't interested. While they were praying to Athena there, Hector marched to the high house of Paris, a fine palace which he had built himself with the craft of Troy's best men. It was they that built the bedroom, they that built the hall and the courtyard next door to brother Hector and to father Priam at the city's heart. There Hector went, loved by Zeus, and in his hand he held a spear six metres long, pointing only one way. The brazen tip, girdled round with gold, blazed before him and announced his presence to the courtyard, to the hall. Then it led him up the stairs and straight to Helen's door. There Paris sat in silence, fingering his glorious arms, his shield and his breastplate and turning a long curved bow in his lap. And Helen, she from Argos, sat there too, among her slave women, directing this and that. Hello, stranger, says Hector to his brother. <laughs> this is no good, this anger in your heart. He deals the words like cards, face up, but his voice is full of purpose and reproach. Around this city, under its steep walls, two armies are fighting, and two armies are dying. And it is for you, for your sake, on your account, that this war surges around our town, that these men bellow for death. Paris lifts a hand in protest, but Hector drives right on. I know you, and I know what you would say if you saw what I see now, a man not pulling his weight. Up now, come, before this place is burned. Paris then is standing, and he is 
one inch taller than his brother, a fact that gives him as much pleasure as his wife. <laughs> brother Hector, he begins, laying a forgiving hand upon the armoured shoulder. You have spoken fairly. You have made your points with justice, and quite well. So I will make some answer. Listen carefully, and take note of what I say. It's not exactly anger that's the reason that I'm here. I'm not offended, really. <laughs> I don't blame the rest. I've retreated to my room because... He pauses. Because I'm sad. <laughs> I am. I'm sad. Sometimes, you know, I look at this old world, this war, and I just can't take it. And I need, I need some me time, just to be alone. <laughs> but it's true, my darling wife here, even now, was urging me with gentle remonstrance to hurl myself straight back into the fray. Indeed, I think the woman may be right. <laughs> Victory is a fair but fickle lover. Perhaps she'll see me now. He winks and waits, but no smile wrinkles Hector's blood cake's brow. Right then, wait a moment. I'll get my gear, or better, go, and I will follow after. You're not so quick as I am. So he speaks, and Hector listens, but from his flashing helm comes no reply. Next, Helen turns and smiles. From her lips, the word, words pour out like honey. Dear Hector, you are my brother-in-law, the brother-in-law of the bitch, a low, filthy, and foul-working creature. Honestly, I wish that on that fateful day, when my mother gave me cursed birth, I wish an evil gust of wind had bundled me up to the mountains, or down to the booming sea, where her wave had swept me under and away before all this. Helen spreads her long, bare arms, and all the world's fragility seems comprehended in the span of those soft hands. But since the gods have made things as they are, I wish I wish I were the wife of a better husband, a man who knew what anger was and dishonour. But this man has no steadiness of mind, not now, not ever, and he will pay the price. But come now, Brother Hector, come and sit on this chair next to me and rest your soul, a noble soul, besieged by unkind cares because of me, the bitch, and my foolish man. This evil fate was granted us by God so that we three should be notorious among lesser men in better times to come. Then to her made reply, he of the flashing helm, great Hector, do not incline me to sit, Helen, hospitable though you are, for you shall not persuade me. Already now my heart riles me to rescue the Trojans who in my absence have desperate need of me. But you, stir up this man, let him even of his own accord press forward so that perhaps he might yet come upon me while I am still within the city. For I myself shall head homewards so that I might behold my household, dear wife and infant son. Not yet do I know whether I shall return to them and come back once more, nor whether the gods even now intend to lay me low under the hands of the Achaeans. So saying, he departed, Hector of the flashing helm, and quickly he, uh, he came upon his well-situated home. However, he did not find white-armed Andromache in his halls. Rather, she with child and well-robed handmaiden was stood upon the battlements, groaning and grieving. Hector, when he came not upon his blameless wife and sighed, went out and stood upon the threshold. And he spoke amongst the house servants. Come, house servants, and truthfully tell me, to where has white-armed Andromache departed from this palace? Either to some place of my sisters, or perhaps of my well-robed brother's wives? Or has she left to the temple of Athena, where all other fair-headed Trojan women are conciliated the dreading goddess? And to him, a bustling servant made reply, 
Hector, since forcefully you command us to disclose the unconcealed truth, neither has she gone to any place of your sister, nor of your well-robed brother's wives, nor even to the temple of Athena, where now all other fair-headed Trojan women are conciliating the dreaded goddess. No, she has gone to the great wall of Ilios, because she heard that the Trojans are, uh, are heavily pressed, while a terrible vigor has meanwhile come upon the Achaeans. She, for this reason, frantically approaches the wall, fanatic in all appearances, and alongside her, the nurse bears your son. What if you saw death on the field and ran back home to see your wife, your son, once more, last chance, and someone said they'd gone? And so you ran back, back once more, same path, same streets, well built for men to live, for walls to last, and so you might. And then, right at the gates, she ran to you, Andromache, a wife to die for, her doting father, Aetian's girl, or was, a wooded mountain dwelling man, a king of men who followed him. Brazen, then, you took his girl, your wife. What if she stood there, face to face, her fingers rooted in your dusty grasp, and held your baby, so beautiful, so sweet, his beaming smile like starlight on your face, warbling, babbling, such a stream, you call him Scamandrius, the lord of your city a city of babies that need you to fight for their lives. Your silent smile, his song, her sobs. What if she called you back? Would you stay? And if she spoke this poem? My God, you'll kill yourself with all your strength. You're heartless. Don't you love him? Look at me, bereaved, widowed, nearly, surely, soon. It's you they'll strike and slaughter, but I who look, who'll lose, I'll sink into a mire of pain. Face your fate, what hollow solace. We're all we have, my parents both are gone, remember? Achilles killed my father. How deific, how we opened up and disemboweled the city of its men. So many, their gates were just as high, and yet he killed him. Do you recall Aetian? He kindly left his armour. I wonder, was his heart contrite? Was it stunned to see his work? He burnt the corpse, exquisitely infused the armour with a healthy glow, heaped some soil. Another's daughters, Zeus's mountain nymphs, set elms about to mark it. A, pl a planted wreath, a copse to crown a mound, miniature tribute of his wooded realm. Pastoral idyll. Yes, my brothers used to watch their sheep, whitely woolly, and their cows until Achilles killed them, sent them shambling into Hades. Like my mother, oh, he spared her, brought her with his loot to Troy, and quick as ever freed her, sold her back for cash. But she's dead, shot by arrows in an Empyrean storm. Don't you see? You are my father, mother, brother, yes. But the point is, you're my husband, lover. Pity me and stay with us. We need you. Don't leave a widow and an orphan child. Lord of your city, we're all frightened and we can't fight. Set your army close to home. There, beside the wild fig tree, they'll be glad, for we need it and we're weak. The Greeks will climb and wreck our walls like ivy. I saw them come three times to pick the spot. Wisely read the signs, perhaps, or else, by instinct, thrill of the kill, they found our jugular. But great Hector of the glancing helmet spoke to her thus. Of course, all these things matter to me as well, woman. But I have a terrible shame of the men of Troy and the women with their training robes if I were to hide away from battle like a coward. Nor does my heart command me to do so. I have learned to be the best, always, and to fight among the first of the Trojans, to win great glory for my father and for myself as well. For I know this well in my mind and in my heart, that there will be a day when sacred Ilius will be destroyed, and Priam, and the people of Priam who wields the Asian spear, 
but I don't care so much for the future grief of the Trojans, nor of Hecuba herself, or of Lord Priam, nor of my brothers, who as many and valiant as they are, will fall into dust at the hands of our enemies. Not as much as I care for yours, when one of the bronze-clad Achaeans will drag you away crying and wrest the days of freedom from you. Then you may end up in Argos, weaving on another woman's loom, or carrying the water of Messais or Hyperia, entirely against your will, but heavy necessity will press upon you. Then someone may say, seeing your downcast tears, look at the wife of Hector, who was the best fighter among the horse-taming Trojans when there was fighting around Ilias. Thus one may say, and you will have renewed grief from the lack of a man like me to protect you from the days of servitude. But I will be dead, covered by a mound of earth, before I hear your cry or see you dragged away. As he said this, radiant Hector reached for his child. But the child leaned away into the bosom of his well girl nurse, shrieking, scared at the sight of his own father, fe fearing the bronze and the crest with, his, with its shaggy horse hair, which he saw nodding forward from the top of the helmet, terrifying. At that, his father and noble mother laughed out loud. Immediately, radiant Hector took his helmet off his head and put it down in all its splendor on the ground. Then, after he had kissed his child and bounced him in his arms, he said, praying to Zeus and to the other gods, Zeus and you other gods, let this son of mine too become ex excellent among the Trojans, just as I am, and as valiant in strength, and rule on Ilius with his, with his might. Then someone may say, look at him, so much better than his father, as he returns from battle, and may he bring bloody spoils of the enemy he killed, and may his mother's mind rejoice. This wish he expressed, he returned the boy to his dear wife's care. She couched him close against her chest and the familiar scent of a mother's skin. Although she smiled, he could see her tears and felt a stab of pity. With caresses, he spoke to her. Sweetheart, don't get too worked up about it, since only fate will let a man bury me. I say no man, no matter his birth, has escaped his fate once he's come into the world. Go back home and see to your own work, like you're weaving, and tell the maids to get on with theirs. War is for men to worry about, for all of us Trojan men, but especially for me. With those words, Hector took his brilliant helmet with its horsetail, and his darling wife couldn't keep from glancing back on her walk home while she cried great tears. In the well-appointed palace of her lethal husband, she encountered her many slave women, and soon she had them crying too. In Hector's very house they grieved for him while still he lived, for they said he would not return, would not escape the Achaeans' assault. Nor did Paris hang about his lofty abode, but put on his famous armour and laid with bronze, and dashed through the city, sure of foot and swift with it. When a horse, well fed in his stable, breaks free from his bonds and gallops across the plain, used as he is to bathing in a rushing stream, he holds himself proudly with his head high and his mane trailing against his shoulders. Revelling in his splendour, he is borne swiftly to the lush haunts of the mares. This is how Paris, one of Priam's boys, came down from the citadel, beaming in his armour like the radiant sun, moving quickly and laughing aloud. And then he overtook his brother, the noble Hector, still leaving the spot where he had spoken to his wife. Divine Paris addressed him first. Good old Hector, don't tell me you're all ready for action and I'm holding you back with my dilly-dallying. Did I not come at the fateful hour as per your command? And Hector, his helmet glinting, replied, you're quite something. No one sensible would cast aspersions on how you acquit yourself in battle. You're brave. However, you're a shirker, and it pains me very much to hear the shameful complaints of our countrymen, who have had to contend with far too much, all because of you. But come on, we'll sort this out later, just as long as Zeus sees fit for us to dedicate a mixing bowl in our halls to the eternal gods above and in freedom's name, once we have driven the Greek armies from our land. <laughs> 